Hi, welcome back. Uh, so uh, we have been really enjoying having these discussions, but today we have a breaking news update. Uh, oh, that's you so know serious. Yes. <laughs> it's not much of a suspense anymore. I mean, it's about the FDA uh, statement on uh, caution in terms of using probiotics in the extreme premature babies. Of course, it's always been an issue in the American Academy recommendations for uh, probiotics and the less than 1000 grams is a very high risk group, as we know. So it's not a surprise, but uh, the question is, uh, what do we do next? So do you want to quickly talk through probiotics and neonatology in a couple of minutes, and then we will come to this point? I, I would love to. I'll just talk about all of neonatology in a couple of minutes. <laughs> okay, so probiotics, uh, I'm sure everybody knows this, but probiotics are the live bacteria. They're also called the commensal bacteria. As you all know, we have millions, billions of bacteria in our guts, all the way through our guts. The colon has even more than the small intestine. And those bacteria are considered commensal bacteria. And they have really important jobs in the role of gut health. So they help uh, build immunity, they help with vitamins, they're cofactors, they help in a huge part in the immune defense of the intestinal system. So we want good bacteria in the gut. The good bacteria is called commensal bacteria. And the, the names, a lot of them are anaerobic bacteria. And you'll know a lot of the names like the lactobacillus. Um, and there's fungal uh, bacteria like saccharomyces, uh, uh, funguses, which are also considered like probiotics. So those are all commensal. They're, they're living in our system, but they're helping us survive. So we know that if uh, we could try to help how those commensal bacteria, we want more of those good bacteria and less of the bad bacteria in the gut. And as you all know, when babies are first born, their guts most of the time are sterile and we're kind of slowly building up that good bacteria in the gut. We know that babies have a slightly different proportion of bacteria in their gut if they're delivered by vaginal delivery versus by C-section. We know that if they're delivered, uh, if they're fed breast milk, then they generally have more commensal bacteria in the gut. But that isn't always enough. We've also come to find that if the commensal bacteria are delivered orally, so that is called when the commensal bacteria are actually being administered, they're called probiotics. So that's what the term is. They are live bacteria that we are giving. And if you go to a supermarket, you'll see probiotics and yogurt and milk and everything. So for some time, we've known that if we give probiotics to babies, then it probably greatly reduces the incidence of necrotizing enterocolitis. And so for several years now, many hospitals have been giving probiotics to premature babies, hoping that it kind of improves the balance of bacteria in the gut and hopefully making it a less inflammatory state and decreasing the incidence of necrotizing enterocolitis. Obviously, a lot of other hospitals have been very worried about administering a live bacteria going into the gut because of the constant fear of, are we going to end up with sepsis? So then what ended up happening this week, Dr. Sridhar? Yes. I mean, obviously, we, we do have issues with uh, probiotics being treated as a food product or food supplement rather than a medication. And the exactly. quality assurance, even though there are good brands which are making them as well. And the other important question is when we look at the research, not the same uh, type of uh, bacteria is used or not a single bacteria. Sometimes they use com combinations and the same combination. All different doses. And yeah. they're given in millions of colony forming units. So it's almost impossible to know exactly which dose you're getting. So it's a very kind of like alternate medicine in a way that we've been giving in the unit. It's just been really difficult to argue against giving it when it has been shown in such large studies to decrease the incidence of NAC. Exactly. I mean, the point we have is obviously uh, lack of homogeneity in what we do. But obviously, there is no doubt, as you said, that dysbiosis, which is the term used when your gut bacteria isn't healthy, does play a very important role in a problem like necrotizing enterocolitis. And when a baby is born, uh, in the hospital, say by cesarean delivery, doesn't stay with the mother, comes to the NICU, we get colonized with the not so good bugs. And many of these babies get antibiotics, which 
do kill the healthy bacteria as well. And the dysbiosis starts from this. And there's a lot of factors you mentioned and the immune regulation, the interaction of the immune cells, the how the body interacts with the toler tolerance to certain organisms versus uh, response, uh, pathogenic uh, response, I mean, killing the bacteria which are pathogenic and so on. Uh, these are very complex topics, but obviously we know that it helps. There is no treatment that's absolutely safe. And uh, the question that comes up is these are extreme premature babies where the gut may be a bit leaky in certain situations as well. And what is given orally can get into the bloodstream. Uh, the difference between bacteremia and septicemia. So obviously we know uh, sucking out the baby's nose is going to cause bacteremia as well. And that's, one, that's why even a baby on non-invasive ventilation is at risk of sepsis. Uh, through their hospital stay, sometimes they deteriorate. Uh, even though they are on full feeds, they are relatively stable. Only uh, thing we do is suction. And uh, when we break down the barrier, what is on the surface, and when we brush our teeth ourselves as adults, you get bacteremia. So was this culture actually septicemia? We don't know the details of this case. It's possible. These are immunocompromised babies as well. But is one case enough to say, and even though the FDA uh, notice says be cautious, I'm sure most units would stop uh, stop using it as a routine at least. So it's going to put, uh, in a litigious society, you start getting worried. So is this the right message to get across? Is it the right way to put it? Obviously, you can look at standardizing, but it's going to be challenging. Uh, has it hit your unit or has you have you heard of any units which have acted? No, we have uh, been using probiotics for some time. We have a very, very low rate of neck. Um, and, uh, and I think probiotics have probably c contributed to that. You know, um, I think that that's honestly a big part of the balance of everything. If you're in a unit where 12% or even 8% of your babies are getting necrotizing enterocolitis, babies that are less than 1500 grams, then at that point you should be doing whatever it takes to try to reduce the incidence of neck. And if there is a risk that there's going to be, you know, one anaerobic sepsis that basically is still like a case report right now. So it's not like the most common thing on the planet. Then, um, you know, at that point, then really what you're trying to do is redu reduce the incidence of neck. Neck is horrible. It's horrible. It kills babies. It majorly interrupts their, it changes their neurodevelopmental outcomes. There are so many long-term effects from it. So for me, saving one baby from neck, it would take, you know, more than the occasional episode of sepsis that a lot of our babies are getting in the unit anyway. Even about a year ago, the AAP came out and said, okay, we're not really sure if, you know, we really wholeheartedly think that everybody should be using probiotics. So people have been going backwards and forwards about this. I do think it would be great if there was some sort of standardization, um, you know, in the colony forming unit, some sort of plan of exactly which uh, which one we're going to use, which uh, commensal bacteria, which we're going to use, what dosing we're going to use, what age we use it on, and when we start giving it, like all of these things are still gray, you know, but I always quote this, that um, when they discovered before major surgeries in adults, that giving a dose of antibiotics majorly reduces the infections of surgeries in adults, then people didn't stick around and say, oh, which dose should we use? Exactly when should we give it? Which antibiotic should we use? Everybody was like, obviously, we should start doing this. And I think neck is so awful that we are so terrified about even one case of neck that I think we should not get too excited about like a recent report. This is obviously my personal opinion that I'm saying here. I'm not saying this from any sort of, um, you know, standardized body, but this is kind of how I interpret this with a lot I of caution. I totally agree. I mean, the problem we have with NEC as well is that the timing, uh, most of these babies have been on respiratory support. They're just starting to turn around and improve. The exactly. parents start hoping for the best at that situation. Yeah. Suddenly it comes out of the blue and upsets your whole appetite to speak. The uh, other important point is that there is absolutely no treatment that we do which is absolutely safe. I mean, you cannot That's say I won't put a central line because it's a line-related infection yes. because these babies need TPN to be saving him. I mean, uh, surfactant therapy, for example, if you say there is an associated pulmonary hemorrhage in some babies, we wouldn't stop using it because the benefit far outweighs. So same way, I wouldn't say if you stop using probiotics, the easy rate is to zoom up because there are so many things we have done in the past few years, right? Especially the feeding regimes, uh, avoiding unnecessary antibiotics. I mean, uh, uh, the general, I mean, 
infection prevention uh, measures that we take as a whole, the bundles, they all reduce. And so um, I don't think we'll go back to a very high rate of NEC, but this is definitely made some difference. There are studies, the Cochrane reviews, which have clearly shown a benefit. Even if you use different bacteria, they do seem to make a benefit. So getting a good dose of uh, good bacteria does seem to inhibit the pathogens and affect the balance. So it's clear that there is a benefit. It may not be as big as it used to be 10 years ago, maybe uh, because overall our practices have become more refined. And, and, and I still... think also the availability of donor breast milk and mother's breast milk, that's been emphasized more. I mean, you know, obviously mother's breast milk does have a lot of uh, probiotics, for want yeah. of a better word, but the good bacteria in it. That so you know, it I mean, that's the best thing. Yeah. yeah. Good. So but I, I agree. think uh, this is to summarize that this is a key issue that has come up. The main thing coming from a body like the FDA would alarm people in terms of litigation risk. And that is one reason why people may hold back a little bit. Wait a minute. And if you say less than 1000 grams, that's a group of babies who really need it. More than 1000 grams probably don't need it anyway. So you're only talking of the group of babies who would need it to benefit. So NEC rate is not high above 1000 grams. And these babies uh, probably don't need it as much as the smaller babies do. So uh, that alone is not an excuse that it's only in the less than 1,000 grams because you're targeting that group mainly. Of course, uh, the American Academy could come up with something supporting, like if you use a certain strain or so on. I mean, but this is Bifidobacterium longum, which is one of the more beneficial bacteria going by the ES Pagan guidelines or the other studies as well. And the combinations usually have this as well. So uh, it's food for thought, obviously, uh, don't make a knee-jerk reaction and side effects are expected. Uh, I don't know how you would communicate with families about this, whether you go to the specifics, because one way, easy way to communicate with families is to say, we are not using that particular uh, bacteria in our probiotics. Yeah. So that's one way to get around it. You have other combinations you could use. You have lactobacillus ruteri on its own, for example, which that's the only available good probiotic we have here. And we use that. Uh, it's a small dose, five drops a day. And uh, we have been using it for a few years. We haven't had, but how many of these may be missed as well? We, we don't look specifically for uh, anaerobic cultures or uh, specifically for these organisms as well. But anyway, I mean, uh, I think we have uh, discussed a reasonable length on this. So um, uh, just one closing comment from you and we'll stop this session. Just exactly what you said, be discerning with all your information. Nothing that we do is going to be 100% advantageous for the baby. Everything comes with a small risk. And I think you have to balance it all in your unit. Even in this day and age, some units have much higher rates of neck. Um, but I think we just all shouldn't jump on you know, a few pieces of negative information. Well said. And uh, with that, we'll close. Do share your thoughts in the comment section if your unit has stopped using it based on this. I think this will apply mostly to the states in the US. Outside the US, I don't think we'll be affected much by this particular FDA, uh, though it does give food for thought. It's the same thing we knew anyway. So uh, we would continue using it as we are. So those of you in the US do comment and share your thoughts. With this, we'll close this session and uh, do share your thoughts and do share the video as well. Thank you. Thank you.